What else can we learn? Well, we, we, if we do this to these rats, they also acquire behavioral problems. It's important to show that it does something, because who cares where the neurons are if the brain is functioning perfectly fine? So, and in fact, there's a lot of literature in developmental neurobiology with other neuronal migration uh, problems where neurons migrate to the wrong place, but they get connected right and they belong to the right kinds of networks anyway, and they don't produce any dysfunction. We needed to know whether ours did or didn't. So we, you know, here's a, a, a paradigm. We have a rat. We give him a tone, and then we give him a gap. You can have nothing in the gap, like silence, or you can put a different tone in there and do whatever you want. And then we give him a really loud noise that makes him jump, okay? But before we give him that big noise, we give him a second tone. If they can hear the second tone, they associate the presence of a second tone with the big noise that's coming right after that, and they don't jump so high, because ah, I know what's coming, right? Ah, eh, you're not gonna get me now. But if they don't hear that second tone, because they, it came too close to the first one, and remember, that's one of the paradigms, that uh, we have a model of rapid processing of sounds, and if they're not able to process sounds as rapidly as the control rats, they're not gonna hear the second tone, sound and they're going to jump just as high because they didn't get the warning. So this is the a paradigm that, that our colleague Holly Fitch used at the University of Connecticut. And here's what we see. These are animals in which we have paralyzed this DYX1C1 gene and we're able to demonstrate with, a, with short gaps the animals that have been paralyzed um, jump much higher than the ones that haven't been. But they have to be juveniles. As they get older, we're not able to show a statistical significance. So that shows something. That shows that you're more vulnerable to these effects when you're very, very young. And these animals, as they get older, they find some compensatory mechanism. We don't know which one it is. So that they're able now to compensate and they can hear enough of the second tone. Or they use maybe executive mechanisms, they must have some, to say, you know, I'm going to assume there's going to be a noise every time. You know, you know who knows? There are other, you don't have to necessarily hear the tone if you make, if you generate a hypothesis saying, there's always going to be one. And I'm not going to, I'm just not going to be taken by this. We don't know how this happens. But something happens and the older animals are able to uh, react more similar to the control animals. The control animals had fake short hairpin RNAs injected, the ones that didn't really fit well into that gene we were trying to paralyze, so it didn't paralyze. But we made them go through all the other parts, and the injection, all this. And so they, they are the same in every way, except in one case they're paralyzed, and in the other case they're not paralyzed in that particular gene function. We, we did this for another five years or so until we got knockouts. In, what are knockouts? The, these are now mice. Now there are some, now there's a, a, the growth of knockout rats. And it's important to do rats because rats have a lot more behaviors that you can study. Mice are a lot more stupid than rats. <laughs> so there are very few behaviors you can study. Maybe we're very stupid and we don't know how to stu study them. But the, the, the fact is that we don't, can't do much with behavior in mice. We can do a lot with behavior in rats, so we try to study rats. But paralyzing a gene for three or four days early on, uh, well, actually, it's quite late that we do it. We, do, we paralyze this gene in the rat just before it gets translated into protein, just before the gene does its thing, which is to code for a protein, okay? We don't know, you know, we're manipulating the gene in a very unique way. When, when, you, when you have a gene variant, you're born with it at conception. Nobody's doing something at the end of when the messenger RNA is gonna finally code for protein. That's sort of very artificial. So the knockout is much more natural and what, what the knockout is, 
is, is our ability to take out a gene from the genome. With a pair of molecular scissors, we go in there, take the gene out. We can take it out. You know, we have two copies of each gene. We can take out one copy. We can take out two copies. We can do whatever we want. Nowadays, you've heard about CRISPR and all this. You can put pieces of gene in, take them out, change them, take a gene out, fix it, put it back in. You know, molecular genetics has become an amazing tool. This is one of the first tools that molecular genetics develop, the ability to just snip out a piece of gene. And you do it when the embryo is 16 cells only. The previous one, we actually injected this blocker into a, a mouse fetus a couple of days before it was born. You know, much later in development. This is more naturalistic because it's like from the beginning. And when you inherit a gene variant from your parents, you, you have it from the beginning, right? So it's more naturalistic. And here's, uh, here's a, a targeted mutation or a knockout uh, using the DCDC2 gene. That's a different gene. It's also very strongly associated with dyslexia in Caucasian populations. I just read a paper that it's not the case among the Chinese. And here, you know, this is the, these are our molecular scissors. We cut out this E2 so that at the end we have E1, E3, and E4, but we don't have E2 anymore. And when you do this, when you cut out that E2, the gene doesn't function. It's not producing the protein that it's supposed to produce compared to the wild type, type control. E refers to exon, these are the business part of the gene, those are the part of the genes that construct the protein. This part of the gene, the black part, is, have, has been called junk DNA, that's because we didn't know what it did, it's not junk at all. It, it contains regulatory gene sequences that make these genes work, start working, stop working, work hard, work, they, they regulate the function of of the, uh, of the exons, and they're called introns. And so this is together, it's a long story, but this is basically what you need to know now. We, we take out one exon and we silence the gene. And we do it in both copies so that our animal is deleted twice here. It has a deletion in two of the copies of the gene. And what happens? Well, lo and behold, even though when we did the short hairpin RNA in the rat and we produced neuronal migration anomalies, when we do it this way in the mouse, we do not produce neuronal migration anomalies. So what is it? Do they cause neuronal migration anomalies or do they not? We're struggling here. I expected neuronal migration anomalies. What am I going to tell my mother now? <laughs> so. We know it's a different animal. Maybe there's a species specificity that if you do it to mice, it doesn't happen because they have other compensatory mechanisms. This is much early lesion. I, the other one was a lesion of the gene near the end here. It's a very beginning. So maybe this gives the opportunity to, of other genes to make up for that knockout that we did early on. Whatever. We don't know. I'm hand waving now. We have no idea. But is this cortex normal? It yes, turns out the cortex is not normal. And it's not normal in a very interesting way. When we, uh, the, these are neurons in the middle of the cortical plate here. These are layer four neurons. These are neurons that receive input from the thalamus. So sound coming in from the outside eventually gets to the thalamus and then gets passed on to these cells in the cortex. And we look at the function of these cells that have had deletion or knockout of this particular gene. And those neurons are very noisy. Here's the control neuron. Chukum, chukum, chukum. Very nice periodic firing of these neurons. Looks very normal cortical neuron here. These neurons are firing all kinds of times. And sometimes they fire a little because they didn't recover well enough before they fired again, so they didn't have enough juice and produced a small 
spike. But you can see this we call noisy neurons. Now, if you wanted to represent sounds, these neurons would be much better to represent sounds than this one because you represent sounds over a pattern that is intrinsic, that is a regular pattern that is intrinsic to the cerebral cortex. So we have noisy neurons. Noisy neurons in this mutation that may not be able to represent sounds properly. 